Thank you so much for coming, everyone, and welcome to our Artists' Roundtable uh, concerning two operas that we're doing in our latest production, Cavalleria Rusticana by Pietro Mascagni and Pagliacci by Ruggero Leon Cavallo. This is a pairing that we haven't done at San Diego Opera in many, many years. I haven't counted, but I was discussing with someone beforehand, uh, being a San Diego native, and I'm sure many of you are, I have seen one performance of Pagliacci in my life, and it wasn't here. <laughs> uh, and I've never seen Cavalleria. You'd think, I, I mean, this is a, a public confession time. <laughs> this is terrible to say. that It's like saying you haven't seen Aida. But frankly, it's just been such a long time that we've done these operas, particularly as a pairing uh, in San Diego. So we're delighted to finally uh, reacquaint ourselves or acquaint ourselves for the very first time with these two terrific pieces. Uh, I'd like to introduce the panel. First of all, at my immediate right, the soprano who will be singing the role of Nedda in Cavalleria. She was last with us in uh, A Streetcar Named Desire by Andre Previn, Elizabeth Futrell. Uh, in the same uh, opera, Cavalleria, singing the role of Turiddu, and evidently he's been here 12 times, <laughs> Richard Leach. Hey, I'm gonna go back to the office and count 12 times. <laughs> Sounds wrong. <laughs> uh, and uh, next to him, I'm, I'm very proud to introduce a former San Diego Opera ensemble member. Um, I, and, and for me, a first to have a former ensemble member here on the panel of the Artists' Roundtable. She was last with us. She'd made her professional debut as a mezzo, but she's here uh, as a soprano singing the role of Santuzza in Pagliacci. I believe she was last with us in La Cenerentola. Oops, uh, Cavalleria. I knew I'd do that. Santuzza in Cavalleria, uh, Carter Scott, soprano. And of course, our conductor who was last here with us, what, Maria Stuarda in uh, February, Eduardo Mueller. <laughs> We're always delighted to have our principal guest conductor back. Thanks. Uh, and uh, next to him, our baritone singing the role of Silvio in Pagliacci. Is that correct? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> who was last here with us uh, in La Boheme with Ricky the last time he was here, uh, Scott Hendricks, baritone. <laughs> and doing double duty, he is Alfio in Cavalleria, Antonio in Pagliacci, making his debut with us, Bruno Caprone, baritone. <laughs> now, Ian didn't actually tell me to do this, but he was so proud of the fact that he remembered that there was an Australian connection to the very first pairing of Cavalleria and Pagliacci. And it happened in the same year as the premiere of Pagliacci. You know, the operas are only two years apart, uh, Cavalleria having premiered in 1890 and Pagliacci having premiered in 1892. There was a, an Australian impresario who was visiting Milan and happened to meet with Mascagni while they were rehearsing Pagliacci and was so impressed with that work, he had already contracted with, uh, 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 I've, I got it backwards again, uh, <laughs> with Leon Cavallo <laughs> to talk about bringing Pagliacci to Australia. He had already Yeah, and we jumped right in to help you, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> talked to uh, Mascagni about bringing Cavalleria. So he was touring uh, one act of, from, from larger operas, I think Faust was also on the, the ticket, and there were a couple of ballets, and I think on tour in Australia in November 1892 was the first time that these two operas were paired. The Met did it about a month later. But then throughout the, huh. the early Met history, they often paired one or the other operas with one act from another opera. For instance, in the Met's uh, 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 records, you could find performances of the second act of Lucia and Cavalleria, which is very odd to us. But I want to give, I, I, I say that not only because Ian is very proud that his native country had something to do with 
the pairing of Hayachi and Calaria. Uh, but the fact is, there were a lot of people who were saying today, maybe it's time that they divorced. Maybe it's time that we paired them with other operas, and maybe not together. Perhaps that pairing, uh, although it was fortuitous at the time, is not the best pairing. Uh, I thought it would be interesting just to explore the subject of these two operas being performed together, what the challenges are. Wouldn't it be easier to do something else that you could double cast? Because you can't necessarily double cast these two operas. They call for two very different casts. But maybe, Maestro, we'll start with you. What do you think of the pairing of Cavalleria and Pagliacci? Does it work? Does it not work? What are the ways that it, it does? It works very well. I like when the <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but uh, you can also split them and do something else. I, I conducted, for example, one production, a uh, very good production uh, in La Scala, and it was with the ballet. It was uh, with uh, La, La Strada of Nino Rota. So very soft. Uh, uh, movie music uh, and it uh, it works also very well but I think uh, the reason why it works very well is uh, because uh, both the opera has been uh, introduced presented to a, a, a competition for one act uh, opera by the editor uh, by the publisher Sonzogno and uh, Cavalleria Rusticana won and this opera didn't win, was not considered, because uh, Pagliacci is in two acts. So the competition was for one act opera. But because uh, the publisher liked so much uh, the libretto and the music, uh, he was interested in, uh, in uh, also publishing it and in performing it. And for this reason, there is an historical reason for doing it together. Then uh, there are very, not a similar, uh, really similar situation, uh, a very dramatic uh, uh, situation belonging to the Italian culture, to the South Italian culture that uh, makes them, uh, let's like say, it, twin operas. But they are two operas, mm. in the sense that the work that a, a theater has to do, that the singers has to do, is really for two productions. Even the cost of the production is for two. Mm. For two. And it's very ra rarely the, the same opera, both operas are sung by, by the same cast. And, uh, and it takes an effort for the theater to do this production. But an effort that uh, is worthwhile, in my opinion, because uh, it's so, so beautiful, the, the Rismo repertoire. And these are, let's say, the best opera that represent the Rismo. And I think in San Diego, and I think in all America, and I think even in Europe, uh, Verismo is underestimated. So our task is not only to do a beautiful job to prepare well the opera, but is to convince uh, the public, American public, uh, to convince uh, American general managers, to convince in uh, that this uh, deserves to be done, to be performed. And uh, there are many other operas like uh, uh, Andrea Chenier, like Fedora, like uh, Catalani, Valli, that should be performed here and has not been done. So we hope to do a, a good job in the sense that uh, he will convince it to do something else of the reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's, it's interesting that you, you spoke of a, um, a pairing of Pagliacci with La Strada, is that, was that right? La Strada, in, yes, in, a ballet with Which Calafati. was based on the film, The, the Secret. Exactly, the same music. Mm -hmm. Because um, they're both slice of life. Verismo is... No, th th they are pagliacci, because even in La Strada, C Caviria is a pagliaccio, a female pagliaccio. Ah, so there is a very good uh, connection yes. even in that. Yeah. But these, these um, Verismo operas always seem to me to be slice of life of... of uh, of Italian, of, of, of a small Italian village, in the case of Cavalleria, a small Sicilian village. Um, they, they have the kind of same, the same atmosphere of some of the films from Italy after the, after the Second World War. They're, they're, they're taking a look at uh, uh, the working poor, for instance. And it seems to me Verismo, being realism, was always about looking at uh, the lives of people who lived at a lower level. Of course it is, uh, and it is a movement that uh, started uh, in Italy. But uh, there are examples even in France, uh, uh, even uh, in, uh, in Germany with the Tiefland uh, uh, of Dalbert, uh -huh. 
and not only in music, uh, in literature with Zola, with uh, others, oh. that uh, it didn't last too long, but it's very, very intense. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many pieces that should be recovered uh, of this repertoire. For example, I was just reading now that uh, Leon Cavallo didn't consider this opera his masterpiece. Mm -hmm. He considered his masterpiece uh, the opera Roland of Berlin. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> So it makes me, <laughs> makes me very curious, uh, yeah. very curious. Uh, not even Bohème, which is a beautiful opera. Leon Cavallo's Bohème is another opera that deserves to be performed. Yeah. And uh, somewhere you can uh, see it, but very rarely. Mm -hmm. But it would be very interesting in one season to do both of them, to see how the two composers uh, uh, approach the, the same uh, the, the same story, hmm. but I, I, I will go and see Roland of Berlin uh, in some <laughs> library. I, I will <laughs> Good luck finding it. Thank you. Um, let's start with with Bruno at the end of the table. Um, you're the only one on the panel who's doing double duty. Yes. You're singing in both uh, pieces. Are the challenges of the two different roles, Alfio and Antonio, terribly different? Is it a taxing evening for it you? It is quite taxing, actually, vocally. It's also a good challenge because it's two different roles, but it's actually, in a way, three different yeah. roles because <coughs> Alfio in Cavalleria, Tonio, and then Tadeo in the Commedia. So um, it's a great challenge as well, dramatically, one hopes, and vocally, um, very much so. I, I'm, I always wonder how a baritone has any steam left after Si Puo, after the prologue of Pagliacci. Well, quite often there's any steam left after the duet yeah. in Cavalleria, <laughs> before even Pagliacci starts, but yeah. um, one can look at it as a warm-up, but it's not really. It's no. a big challenge in itself, Cavalleria. And um, I've also heard colleagues say in the past that have done both together, never again. <laughs> I've also said it myself, but um, as I've got older, become slightly easier. <laughs> so you have done this double, yeah. triple yeah, role before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Scott, the, the, the challenges of Silvio. Um, talk to us about this character. Um, well, staying well, um, because Elizabeth <laughs> arrived with a cold and now I have it. <laughs> so it's the Silvio Nedda. They always have to be careful, as you'll see. Um, <laughs> Um, the challenge of Silvio, um, there isn't any. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just fun to sing. Really? It's not uh, particularly difficult. He's, um, you know, kind of a straightforward guy, you know, and in and, and this particular case, you know, a young, um, as, uh, as Lotfi put it, a young studly peacock you know, comes out, thinks he's, you know, the handsome stud of the town, and he's got himself a really good-looking gal, and um, which he does. Um, <laughs> um, so it's actually just a lot of fun. Um, and beautiful music, and too. beautiful, yeah, beautiful music. So there's, you know, nothing challenging about having fun and singing beautiful music. It's oh, just the, the, the duet is. Gorgeous. It's yeah. lovely, lovely stuff. I mean, it's one of those roles that's been called a baritone role, but I don't find it particularly high. I think there are, you know, poses higher than Silvio, I think. Um, <laughs> um, so it's, it's just a lot of fun. Carter, the, the uh, challenges of singing the role of Santuzza, which is one of those roles that often is cast for a mezzo as well. I, I think I started learning it as a mezzo. Um, when the other guys were talking about their challenges, I just remember yesterday, um, after rehearsal, um, the director just kept pulling more emotion out of me. And I guess the challenge that I find, um, not necessarily the tessitura or the length of this role, it's just emotionally draining, I have to say. Mm. Yeah, and I just found that out yesterday when he kept pulling more and more and more out of me and he, um, I've done this role before and I've, I've done it such that I sort of go, go physically sort of go into myself and he's really trying to get me to go to show the audience 
everything that's going on. So it's, that's the challenge, is to sort of recover after that. And I had a, a, a difficult time recovering yesterday, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Physically or emotionally? Emotionally, or? I would <laughs> say, yeah. It, I, I consider myself a strong, physically strong person. Um, but yeah, I was just completely drained. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's the challenge. And it's good to find it out now, you know, yeah. week before. <laughs> that's what rehearsal is for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's what Lofty has asked me to do. He said, go as far as you can, and then I'll pull you back. And he's, yeah. he's even pulling me further. So it's interesting. Good. And then to read do, um, this is your first. Yes. Right? Yes. And um, did you did you avoid it? Had you been asked to Absolutely. do it before? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, those that know me uh, at all know that I've always been conservative with my repertoire choices, always sort of being asked to do something maybe that's heavier than I want to sing at that age. And so uh, this is another role that I wanted to wait until I really felt like it was right. And I'm really happy I did because now I feel like I can jump in with both feet. It fits. It's fun. And uh, I'm having a blast with it, so it's great. I, uh, <coughs> I interesting talking about Lotfi, our, our stage director, Lotfi Mansouri, is is it's really exciting how he is pressing us <coughs> to try to get the emotion out of these pieces, and uh, and again going back to how they are verismo pieces, they are real, very real pieces, and trying to find in these very dramatic pieces that essence that is great drama. And as Lotfi tells us several times over and over again, to the edge before it becomes melodrama. And so, so he's really finding that, that way to press us to the point within realism to get those emotions. But then so it's not overdone. And the great thing about the pieces, both of, those, both of the pieces, is that that Verismo style is so evident in these pieces. So often, uh, operas that we love um, have a style that is imposed on them that, that, that doesn't let every instant of the evening evolve in a very natural way. You have the Lucia Sextet or you have you know extended moments of, of duet or something that are somehow not authentic, organic, real. And that's not true in these pieces. Even an extended duet, it's every moment is real. And that's what lets this drama build and build and build and these emotions come out. It's really exciting. Do, do you, and, and, and this might be something we'd open up to everybody too, is do you think that the, uh, um, is Verismo more about the story and the libretto and about the setting, or um, can we actually talk about Verismo music? Well, is there if a you're going to ask me, I, I don't know, because I'm not a, a great mus musical historian at all. I don't, I, you know, I don't know any of the real answers. <laughs> but from my perspective, Verismo it has to do with exactly what I was saying, our ability to execute uh, a moment, a scene, uh, an, uh, an idea, an aria, uh, in a real manner. Mm -hmm. And whether or not the style of the writing, of the music, of the drama, lets that happen. And some pieces let it happen better than others. And so for me, that's what defines Verismo. I'm sure there are many other elements that Maestro can talk about that define Verismo. But for me, that's what it com boils down to. Mm -hmm. It is uh, pretty challenging for uh, a conductor to conduct Verismo, especially the relation with singers especially the relation with a certain kind of uh, <coughs> culture of singers, because it is so easy to lose uh, the idea of what the composers rolled, uh, wrote uh, and uh, just express uh, your personal feelings. The task of a conductor in Verismo is really to remind uh, singers uh, that everything what the composer wanted is written there. So I must uh, not uh, stimulate the singers. They are already stimulated by the words, uh, by the situation, uh, by the, the beautiful tunes that are uh, in, uh, in this music. I think Merismo, from a conductor's point of view, must be treated exactly as Donizetti, exactly as Mozart, exactly as, uh, as Verdi must be treated. 
everything is written, let uh, what is printed uh, sing and speak. And uh, it will come out uh, a, a wonderful drama because the composers uh, um, knew what they were doing. Of course, with different means. Uh, if you look at the painting uh, of, uh, of Giotto, it's not the same colors that, uh, that Rembrandt used or that Picasso uses. But uh, this doesn't mean that uh, you must be extremely serious uh, with the re in the respecting what the composer wrote. A different style. Th that's uh, the, the, the richness of music, as, uh, as in any other kind uh, of art. But let me say a few words, because now I'm so sorry that uh, Mansuri, Lotfi Mansuri, is missing, because uh, he is probably the most important person in, uh, in the, not in the panel, but in this production. He knows the piece so well. He is uh, a musician, he is a theater man, and he has a great personality, <coughs> and sometimes uh, he even uh, goes uh, more far, not too far, <laughs> but more <laughs> far, touching also what uh, I should, uh, what sh my work should, uh, should be, mm. working musically with the singers. Well, I'm so happy that he does, First of all, because he is always so nice in asking me if I agree. Then I have only to say, yes, yes, do it. And he does the <laughs> job. And he does the job. Then uh, I sometimes revenge saying, but don't you think that this movement is done too, too far? Or is <laughs> and we have a good, uh, good uh, speech, a good uh, relation in this sense. But uh, what I want to emphasize is uh, how deeply Lotfi Mansuri is involved uh, in this production. <laughs> Even Mansuri himself, uh, I never saw so much involved uh, in uh, asking to the last detail. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, we, in the afternoon before doing this, uh, the, this uh, nice reunion, we rest a little bit because we more or less uh, already block the, the, the opera. No, he wanted to rest just two half hour ago, we finished with him. He works like a lion. <laughs> he gives 100% of himself. And I think if we will have success, it will be a lot because of him, I'm sure. Let's turn to Nedda. And this is your debut as uh, Nedda in Pagliacci. So let's talk about the challenges of uh, of this role? Well, um, it is a first for me and uh, an exciting first for me. I, I don't venture, I haven't so far ventured into these Verismo operas um, at all, really, except for Musetta in La Boheme. Um, but that's kind of different. And um, so it's, it's a wonderful um, challenge for me. And I must say that I feel that I am in the best hands possible between Maestro Müller and Lotfi Mansouri. Um, the two of them are giving me, as, as Maestro said, uh, Lotfi is giving so much um, of himself and uh, his ideas and his, his wisdom about this role and about this opera to me. And Maestro Müller is, is giving me the same um, from a musical point of view. So I, if I'm not the best Netta in the world, it's, it's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally my fault <laughs> because I'm getting everything uh, possible from them. And the, the, the exciting thing, uh, back to some of what Ricky was saying, was that, uh, that every, every moment is, is immediate emotion. You know, there, there's nothing, uh, I, I've sung a lot of Handel operas, I've sung a lot of uh, Bel Canto operas, and you're sort of trying to invent and create the emotion um, for those operas. There is emotion, of course, in, in that music, and, but it's a different kind of thing. It's a s more subtle um, evolution of emotion in those operas. And here, it's, uh, you say what you mean at that moment, and then you change your mind, and you say mm. what you mean at that moment, and then you turn around and slap this guy, mm. and that one stabs you in the chest, and you know, it, everything is happening. I know, it's bad. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's happening sort of real time, you know, in this, in this piece, and it's really exciting and, and challenging at the same time. Um, 
but I but I do agree that the music underscores all of all of the drama. Um, it 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 creates the drama. Um, the libretto, of course, is is as important, but um, the way that the piece is constructed musically allows the drama to to happen and unfold in this sort of real time way. And so it's really exciting to try to put all that together and, and coordinate it um, as a singer and, and an actor. Um, I should have mentioned that, um, of course, we invited Jose Cura to be with us as Canio in Payachi, but he doesn't arrive till tomorrow. <laughs> so that's obviously impossible. Um, and he had uh, uh, responsibilities, I believe, conducting uh, responsibilities, I think, is what Ian told me in, in, in Germany. But um, we can talk about him <laughs> because he's not here. Well, but we, we can talk about the character of Kanyo, who is a, really one of the s stronger characters in Italian opera, it seems to me. And, and the, the challenges of that role vocally, uh, Maestro. Would you say are, are really? It's a, this is a, you need a tenore di forza. See, we need a tenore di forza, maybe even more in cavalleria. We <laughs> need, true, which, in my yeah. opinion, is more difficult vocally than Pagliacci. Really? Pagliacci is so famous, uh, the, the beautiful arias, uh, and cavalleria too. But uh, long, first of all, is longer cavalleria role, yeah. and then the tessitura beginning just with the first aria, the, let's say, backstage that will not be completely backstage in our production, but is a tessitura that is extremely difficult, and in Pagliacci you don't find it. You find the good top notes, but then you go back in the tessitura and you sing in the normal, uh, in the normal tessitura. But let me say that Cura did a recording of the whole opera, and Cura did the recording of a few arias uh, conducted by himself, uh, or Pagliacci. Okay. His ideas are compl completely different than what I'm doing here. Lo will be very interesting, <laughs> will be very interesting tomorrow when he arrives, when we have our first musical <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting. You and I'm the one he stabs, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the comparison between the two roles surprised me when I addressed them both. When Ian first asked me to do Cavalleria, I had never done it before. I had never done Pagliacci before. And um, I was excited to do the Cavalleria, uh, maybe naively thinking, actually, that it was somewhat more lyric than the Pagliacci. That's what I've always thought, yeah. And, uh, in the interim period of time, I've had an opportunity to do Pagliacci a couple of times and uh, got to know it very well. And I learned that even though it's extremely dramatic, it actually is in many, may, many ways a more lyric role than is uh, Turidu. Lyric in the sense of just not heavy dramatic singing. This is considerably, the testatura of it is, is, is difficult and it creates its, its unique challenges. And I'm glad I waited till now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that you're not doing both of them. Yeah, doing I mean, both in one night, that, that is a challenge that I, I'm not sure I'll ever jump into. That it, would be tough. I mean, are, there, you know, are there singers that do I've, it I've finished Pagliacci now, you know, several times, and I've got, you know, I sort of finished it, and I've got, oh, it's just three quick scenes, it's nothing. You know, it's, an, it's just, you know, 20 minutes of singing, it's nothing. And I finish it, and I'm just drained, again, emotionally as well as vocally. You're just sort of like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and uh, so... I don't know that I'll ever do them both <laughs> together. I've actually just um, done it earlier at the end of last year with Kura, and he did the both. So he he did do both. Yeah. Well, I can go home then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, that must have been fascinating to to sort of watch from. Yes, it was. It was mar marvelous. And hopefully to hear. And actually, uh, I agree. I thought the, the person that's going to have the biggest challenge is going to be Maestro. Yeah. <laughs> in, my, in my long career, I passed worse than that. I assure you. <laughs> but very exciting, yeah, marvelous. Yeah. Very intense artist. Have any of you been involved in singing or, um, or conducting any other works by these two composers, by Mascagni or by Leon Cavallo? I haven't. Uh, 
not in conducting, but uh, in uh, assisting other conductors, uh, yes, many of these. And there are wonderful pieces uh, that I, I repeat uh, should be done. For example, Iris, Mascani's mm. Iris is a wonderful opera. And for example, Fedora, Fedora is another wonderful opera. And, uh, and another opera that I like, uh, nobody does, not even in Italy, that I like very much is Le Maschere. Le Maschere is another uh, Mascagni opera with a fantastic overture and very beautiful music on the Commedia dell'arte, the characters of uh, Arlecchino, Colombina, what we are doing uh, in a small dimension uh, in Pagliacci, but a full opera. There are many, there are many beautiful operas. I, I hope uh, it should be a mission uh, for, for many for musicians and singers to, to, to rediscover this repertoire. Of course, uh, you need a special kind uh, of singers because uh, all these operas need uh, powerful voices, uh, great uh, scenic uh, personality, and, uh, and there are not so many in the world. But uh, we can... Uh, as there has been uh, a, a, a Donizetti Renaissance, uh, a, a Vivaldi Renaissance, uh, a early Verdi Renaissance, uh, there should be, and I hope it will happen uh, in, in the future, not to, not to far a, a, a rediscovering of this repertoire. I've actually, I've not appeared in, but I've actually seen Leon Cavallo's Bohème and also I Medici. Did you? Yeah, which was... Very good, also. Mm -hmm. mm. Very valid. Um, I, I find it, again, so uh, strange that, these, that uh, both of these composers didn't have greater success uh, than, than they did. Mascagni, of course, was connected to the regime during the Second World War in Italy, and so he had to recover from his, uh, his reputation really, uh, <coughs> although I don't think Cavalleria ever left the repertoire, ever. That's true, but uh, w this uh, is one of the reasons uh, why the composer has been neglected after uh, the, so, the, yeah. the falling of, uh, of the fascism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Respighi too was, uh, and uh, Mascagni, what Mascagni was for opera, Respighi was the, for the instrumental music, uh, extremely good composer. Mm -hmm. For the singers, um, one last question just about, about your roles. Do you find that, um, depending on which opera you're in, it's so difficult to talk to about two operas at the same time, uh, depending whether it's Pagliacci or Cavalleria, that uh, these composers, at a very young age, because these were first efforts exactly. for, for both of them, knew how to write for the voice? Carter? I think so. I think it's... Um Uh, first of all, the lines are are beautiful to sing. Take a big breath. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's really beautiful music to sing. Um, I just did a bunch of Strauss, um, which is beautiful to sing too. But you know, s sort of completely different and completely the same. Take a big breath and go. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it's it's really beautiful music to sing. Um, I cannot wait to get with the orchestra. I just really cannot wait for that, and I think it'll it'll just be lots of fun. Tomorrow so morning. I <laughs> know. I think that one of the reasons for the role of Toriddu, it's it tends to be thought of as a role that's for a mature singer, more mature vocally singer, vocally mature singer, is that in the writing. Even what sounds like the simplest song, the uh, the Brindisi, uh, this wonder, you know, Viva um, Vino Spumeggiante, he brings everybody to, to drinking, and it sounds like the loveliest little drinking song, as does the first little offstage aria that Maestro was referring to. But the testura is such that perhaps it has to do with the youngness of the composer. Mm -hmm. There's not built into it the sort of uh, tessitura relief mm -hmm. that comes. Um, with some many other composers, uh, it sort of gets there and stays there. It's gorgeous and it's wonderful to sing, but you better know what you're doing while you're there because you're not going to come down and rest for mm -hmm. a second and then mm -hmm. regather and go back. 
you're going to sort of just stay there and sing this lovely line mm. and um, plan to stay there for a while. Yeah. Uh, how about the baritones? Do you find that, that uh, did uh, Mascagni and Leon Cavallo get it right for you well, guys? I suppose uh, yes, but I do find the, the, the Tessitura, I sing a, lo a lot of Verdi, which is basically middle to high voice and it does lie beautiful cantabile lines and stuff like this. Um, the Verismo, also Puccini, the writing is quite extreme. <coughs> it can be very high, but it also can be very low. And there's a lot of low passages in both Cavalleria and Pagliacci. Um, so that is also another challenge vocally, but you know, one learns, one works in that, and that's her job. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you feel the composers knew what they were doing by the time they got to, to if for that style. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, considering I'm learning "Death in Venice" by Benjamin Britten, I run to rehearsals, looking <laughs> forward to singing. I actually ask to be included in rehearsal more than I already am. Um, I think it's written beautifully. That's what we're, I mean. When you asked earlier about the challenge of of the role. I was thinking of it more, uh, well, uh, both dramatically and musically. Musically being that the way it's written is just, well, f you know, each, whenever you feel like something is made for you, you know what I mean? Um, Silvio is just one of those that just always felt comfortable and it's just really, really fun singing. Mm -hmm. So I. He just loves uh, singing, laying on his back, making out with his prime. That's right. <laughs> 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 um, there is a, a very strange production of the two of these operas on uh, DVD recently, in which the director, I suppose, decided to open the evening with the prologue from Pagliacci, and then it, of course, ends. There's a cadence. And then we go into Cavalleria. <laughs> Interesting. And then we start with you know, the rest of Pagliacci when Cavalleria That's is over. That's interesting. So the prologue becomes a prologue to the entire evening. Sure. Which is, it, it, it really, I thought perhaps they'd made a mistake, yeah. you know, <laughs> copying the DVD or it, it just Was seemed- Was it in Germany? No, no Spain. It used to be Babel. It used to be Babel back then. <laughs> no, uh, it's from the Teatro Real in Madrid. Very odd. Um, are, has anyone ever ha had any other odd experiences with either of these, with productions of these, uh, well, of these in, operas? Um, well, Scott and no, I. Have no, I know in, in Barcelona something worse, but uh, I, I cannot uh, tell the story because uh, it's uh, not for uh, people under uh, 16 uh, years. Uh, <laughs> what they did. <laughs> but I think the idea of the prologue to start with is it creates this thing with Pagliacci of a play within a play within a play. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that you're presenting the two operas, doing the prologue first, to me actually makes an uh, inter inter interesting It's interesting. It's just I, it, yeah. it, musically it sort of made me a little crazy. But yeah. But yeah. Uh, it, you were going to say something about a production of was it yeah, Scott? Scott? Yes, Scott, Scott please. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't me, it was Bruno. It was <laughs> <laughs> no, br uh, to show you how small the opera world is, five years ago, um, w Bruno and I were both uh, fest in Cologne, meaning that we were part of the ensemble. He, um, and five years ago, uh, we did a Pagliacci, a Cav Pag. He, I, I did the, the premiere. He revived it last year with Cura. And this is the season. Um, and in this particular production, Silvio is a part of the audience from the very beginning, and he and uh, Tonio have a confrontation at the beginning of the show during the prologue. Mm. Uh, Tonio stabs Silvio, and Silvio bleeds throughout the opera. And this traveling, <laughs> this this troop that's traveling around are vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the commedia. In the second <laughs> act, we are dressed normally, but the audience are all in costume. Not us. Comedia. Willkommen in Deutschland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. I actually liked it. I, uh, yeah. you know, I, I <laughs> Vampires. <laughs> and, the, and, and ironically, the cavalleria is totally traditional. Ish. 
Although it's the whole piece is set in the church, inside the church, so there's no going into church, you're already in the church, etc. And it also had its moments. <laughs> <laughs> Faint, uh, uh, damning with faint praise. Um, well, I, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Also, to remind the audience that um, um, you can see these artist roundtables now on YouTube. So I'm glad we didn't go too far talking about either Lotfi or um, Jose for not being here tonight. But uh, you did very well, and we won't have to edit anything. <laughs> thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.